Uh, we are continuing our sermon series on sin, so get excited for that. Uh, this sermon series is called Getting Right with God. Don't worry, this week we're not talking about the origin of sin with Adam and Eve. No, we're moving on. We're moving on a little bit, but only a few chapters further in Genesis, actually. Um, we're doing this series really as I joke and jest about sin. It's because, you know, there is no doubt in my mind that we were made to live in right relationship with God. That was the original plan for God, to live in right relationship with him, right? We can see it highlighted very at the beginning of our scriptures, and we see that God, he made us to be loved by him. And then it also works the opposite way. We were made to love him. This how, this is how, there's this reciprocity with love, with God. It's an expectation that, yes, we love him, but also that love rains down on us. We are made to live in a right relationship with God, and a right relationship with God looks an awful like love. That's how it works. But as highlighted last week, as we kicked off this series, we just do not, cannot, and will not live in a right relationship with God. And don't feel too bad about that this morning, because it's just impossible. That's a reality. It's impossible for us to constantly live right with God, because we are gripped by that tricky, crafty thing called sin. We just don't perfectly follow all the rules and abide in what our God tells us to do. We often succumb to, like we talked about last week, it's the weakness of the flesh, weakness of the eyes, and then we fall into the weakness of our own pride and ego. But I've got good news. i got good news. From the origin of sin, all the way in Genesis 3 that we talked about last week, all the way up until now, our God is doing something just so incredible. He's on this incredible rescue plan. That's what I'm going to call it, a rescue plan. Our God's love is so grand, it's so extravagant, that he's been on a search and rescue mission to save each and every one of his children along the way in life. And it's on this rescue path that we can, yes, be saved by God, but we can only be saved by God. Yes, it's on this rescue plan that we can get right with God, but most importantly, we can stay right with God. But why wait? Why wait? Why do we wait for God to come and rescue us? Why can't we get right with him right now? What are some of the things that stop us and prevent us from doing that? Once again, that's our sermon series. We talked about why we have to get right with God last week. This week, we're going to see God initializing his rescue plan by looking at one of the great patriarchs of our scriptures. This morning, we're going to be looking at Abram, or as you may know him as Father Abraham, right? I'm not going to sing too much this morning. You're, you're stuck, stuck just watching videos. Uh, but by reading through the story of Abram, we're going to discover that our God makes a covenant with us. Now, he doesn't just make a covenant with Abram. He makes a covenant with all of us. And why is that such a big deal, a covenant? Well, I think it's simple, really, because in this covenant between Abraham and God, it actually encompasses a promise that God makes to all of us, too. All are included in this promise, promise. you and me and every generation before us and every generation after us, okay? There's this promise that God makes that we can all grip on and hold on to. But we got to take just a quick step back this morning, and we just got to talk about something simple, like what is a covenant anyways? Because a covenant is this fancy biblical term that pastors like to use that just makes things more complicated. Do you know what a covenant is? It's just a promise. It's a sacred promise, but it's a promise. It's an agreement, an agreement. It's a contract between God and his people. That's what a covenant is. In our scriptures, we see six big covenants between God and his people. And believe it or not, they're like, most of them are really early on in the scriptures, okay? The first one is with Adam. God makes a promise to Adam. Then he makes a promise to Noah. You know this promise. Do you know what the promise is that God makes with Noah? He marks it with a rainbow in the sky. We know, we know the Noah story. We know that Noah promise. The third is Abram, Abraham. We're going to go over that one this morning. There's also one with Moses and David. But finally, there's this last covenant. It's called a new covenant, which is fulfilled by the life of Jesus Christ. That's actually next week's sermon. So there you go. There's a sneak preview of what's to come. But today, we're going to focus on this Abraham covenant 
that many of us know, perhaps, when you hear me uh, read the scripture this morning, but maybe you don't. But why does this, why are we focusing on this one specific covenant? It's interesting, isn't it? There are six of these covenants. Why doesn't Mark Moore, who's the author of the book we're using this year for Core 52, why, why aren't we doing all six promises that God makes to his people? Why only two? <laughs> really, it's fascinating. Why does this specific covenant matter so much? I think we're going to look at it today and you're going to figure out why. It's because this is the initialization of the rescue plan. It's God showing his love for us in this unique way. And God, he loves us so much. He's willing to make an eternal promise for every generation that's going to come. Mind you, not just any promise, but a sacred promise. That's what a covenant is. And this promise is special because this promise can be trusted. It's real. It's true which is kind of unusual for us, isn't that? I want to take you back, for instance, back to your childhood and think of the promises that you used to make with your friends or your parents back when you were a kid, all right? Now, nowadays, a promise is when you're an adult, it's only as good as the person who's making that promise, isn't it? We, we got to trust the person who's making the promise. That's really about how it goes in today's society. But as kids, you know, you marked your favorite promises by the sacred pinky swear, didn't you? A pinky promise, right? The bonds of friendship are built on pinky swears as kids. And when the pinky swear covenant is broken, the world falls apart, in my opinion. Uh, but there's some day, and I, you know, there's some line of demarcation where you get old enough that pinky promises don't mean anything anymore, right? It's that fretful, tragic day where it just is too old, you're too old, and people break their promises. Now, maybe for you, you didn't do pinky swears or pinky promises. I get that. But maybe you said a limerick or a rhyme instead, okay? Have you ever said, I swear, cross my heart and hope to die? Or did you say, I swear on my mother's grave? Ugh. Both of those are really morbid, by the way. When, when did we start making promises using our life as a, you know? But, oh, anyways, I digress. There is some line of demarcation, right? That you just get too old and you stop saying that stuff and your promises, you know, they, they kind of just fall away. But I think the ultimate way to make a promise as a kid is illustrated by a special type of handshake, which is equal parts disgusting and serious. And instead of me, like, having someone come up here to demonstrate with you this morning, I want to show you from one of my favorite clips from the Newsies. Let's take a look. Well, so I'll consider that an investment. We sell together, we split 70, 30, plus you get the benefit. What's the matter? It's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Who's ever made a spit handshake before? No? Does anybody do it? No? Okay, maybe that crossed the line. I was watching that movie with Andrew the other week, and I, he was like, oh, I'm going to start doing that at school. And I was like, no, you ain't, because you're going to get the flu. Uh, <laughs> Nothing means a real promise like a spit handshake, right? Even if it is disgusting. All jokes aside, you know, as we do get older in life, handshakes, pinky swears, whatever, they all go away, don't they? A person is only as good as their word when it comes to promises. And let's be honest, we all break promises from time to time. As parents or as children, we all do it. We all do it. But friends, that's the difference between us and God. A sacred promise from God, you see, is a promise that is definitive. It is concrete. It is real. It's not going to fail. It's guaranteed. And my hope this morning is that I can show a little bit of that Abrahamic covenant with you. And you can see how God holds up his end of the covenant. All right? So in our year-long study of Core 52 by Mark Moore, our main scripture this morning is out of Genesis chapter 15. I'm going to be reading, of course, from a larger section, but when we get to our memory verse, which is real short, actually, um, I'm going to ask you to join in with me and say it out loud, okay? So I'm starting in Genesis 15, starting in verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? 
For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Elizer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him, God brought him outside and said, Look towards heaven and count the stars, if you're able to count them. (laughs) Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And will you join in with our core 52 verse of the week? And Abram believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteous. I'm going to continue on in the scripture out of Genesis 15. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them in two, lying each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Kind of weird, right? We're going to go over that, don't worry. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know this for certain, that your offspring shall be aliens in the land that is not theirs, and shall be slaves there, and they shall be oppressed for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your ancestors in peace. You shall be buried in a good old place. Age. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Will you pray with me? Oh, Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth this morning and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be found holy and acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So God makes a sacred promise with Abram. He hasn't changed his name yet to Abraham. It's coming just a few chapters later. But he says to Abram, he says, look towards the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them, which we all know you can't count the stars, right? And then he said to him, so shall your descendants be, right? Who knows this covenant? Who's seen or heard this covenant? It's, yeah, okay. Some of us know it. It's pretty, it's pretty big in the, in the Bible. We know this. But there's so, something so interesting about this promise that God makes to Abram in this situation. Abram has no offspring. He has no children. He has no heir to claim as his own. And he's kind of bitter about it. Isn't he with God? He's, he's saying, I've got a slave. He's going to end up being my heir, God. What are you doing here? <laughs> But here's the interesting thing, and what makes it so interesting to me, is I think we really empathize with this situation that Abram finds himself in. He's in a difficult life situation, isn't he? Without a child to call his own. Now, as a quick aside, that was a really, really big deal back in biblical times. Huge. Because the size of your family was often how you were interpreted to have power and presence in your local community. It was all based on how many children you had. After all, how could you in any other way pass down your traditions and history if you don't have someone or children of your own to pass it down to, right? So Abram, interestingly enough in Genesis 15, is stuck in this really interesting uh, transitional time of his life, all right? I'm going to call it, we're going to demark it as God being stuck, or I'm sorry, Abram being stuck in the space between, in this in-between space, okay? All right. On one side of this time of Abram's life is God's promise, right? God made a promise, right? And then on the other side of where Abram is is the fulfillment of that promise. He's stuck between the two places. He's in this, in this interesting time. And I think that's why we empathize with Abram because, friends, don't we know what it's like to be stuck in between? Stuck in between waiting for something to happen from a promise that we have just been given? I don't know about you, but who hasn't been stuck in that time? I think of the worst time to be stuck in between as a kid is middle school. 
You're, you're literally stuck in between a physical, emotional, and relational transformation. You are stuck in between. You're stuck in between right after college, trying to figure out what the last 22 years of your life had detailed into school and education, or even longer for some of us like me, and then you're transitioning into this work field. What is that going to be about? Maybe you transition in a time of changing jobs, where you have to learn new payroll and new accounting and new health care, a transitional time. Maybe the transitional time for you is when you finally hit that magic year where you're officially over the hill, okay? Transitions in life. What makes it so hard for Abram here is that God makes this incredible promise, does he not? And yet Abram cannot fathom in his mind how God, at his old age, could give him offspring, Abram's old, friends, at this time in Genesis 15. He is old. He's putting God in a box, though. That's what Abram's doing. He's saying, "Eh, God, I'm 80 years old. How could I have a child? Sarai, my wife, is 80 years old. How could she bear a child? He's putting God in a box. And I think that's why we empathize with this story, because we know what it's like to be stuck in between, don't we? God's promise is here. Ultimate fulfillment is is here, and we're stuck here. You know, when I pray and worship a lot of times, you know, I drone on for three minutes or whatever. You guys close your eyes. I'm appreciative of that, so you don't look at me fidgeting and reading off the page. But we always end our prayers the same way, don't we? With the Lord's Prayer. We say the prayer out of Matthew 7, given to us by Jesus. That's why we say the Lord's Prayer. And we say it, this interesting line in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come. Do you ever know that? Do you ever pay attention to that? Thy kingdom come means we're praying for God's kingdom to come to earth. That's literally what we're saying. God has promised his kingdom to us. This wholeness, this perfection, this Eden that we talked about last week. He promises us it. And I don't know about you, but I look around my world and I sure don't see it here yet. (laughs) I see a whole lot of brokenness. I see a whole lot of sin. We are stuck waiting for his kingdom to the come. We are stuck in this moment in between God's promise and its ultimate fulfillment. It's a moment that we know that is exclusively heartbreak and sin and brokenness. So, so when we look at this core 52 passage that Mark Moore picked out out of Genesis 15, here's what we have to realize is that Abram is just like us, stuck in between. And God comes down in the very first lines out of Genesis 15 are, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. I think that's incredible. God, in this moment of being in this tricky life situation, he comes down and says, let me, Abram, be your shield. I am your shield. Because the interesting thing is, is when we're stuck in these in-between Spaces, middle school, like I said, right after college perhaps, whatever that time is for your life. It seems like in these moments of transitions, we're constantly attacked. We're attacked by culture, we're attacked by relationships, we're attacked by our work, we're attacked by all these things. We're constantly tested in the space between. And in the space between is often when we become bored, we become distant, we become toxic or self-indulgent, that pride issue, right? We become toxic to our environment. In other words, we do what? We sin. That's what we do. While we wait and twiddle our thumbs, we keep busy quite often by sinning. I think that's the first takeaway we have to get from the Abrahamic covenant, is we have to realize that God is here to protect us, to shield us in this time of life where we're waiting, where we're stuck in between. To get right with God, we must let God protect us. Seems simple, right? We just have to let God protect us, but uh, (laughs) there's always a trick. Allowing to get right with God means that we have to pledge our faith to God, and we have to trust that he's going to protect us. You know, too many times in this world, we rely on other people or other things to protect us, don't we? You know, for instance, we see people place their identity in their jobs all all the time, don't we? We see that happen. And inherently, a job's not a bad thing, but there are consequences when you let your job be your identity. There's also consequences when you let culture decide who you should be. There are consequences for doing so. I get it. It's hard to put your full trust in God and let that be your identity 
to allow him to protect you as your shield? Because here's the thing. We're smart. We're pragmatic. We're practical people, aren't we? We want a backup plan. We want, we want to know that there's a net beneath us to catch us when we fall. We want the backup to the backup to the backup. You know, when you're picking a college, you have a backup school and a backup of the backup, don't you? That's how it works. We want the backup plan. Friends, you can't trust God and have a backup plan. <laughs> you can't allow God to be your shield and then have something extra on the side to catch you when you fall. That's what I'm saying here, is we have to leave the slivers of doubt in our minds to the side. And the thing with Abram is, friends, he was the father of all descendants, as we say, <laughs> as many as there are stars in the sky. But even Abram doubted. Abram doubted in front of God and to God, face to face. That would be kind of scary for me individually. But he says to God, oh Lord, God, what will you give me for I continue childless? You have given me no offspring, God, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. Once again, Abram cannot fathom how God works. He, he wants a backup plan. And I bet you want a backup plan too, like me. Because when we have a backup plan, we doubt. Abram doubted. He doubted. He didn't have full faith. Maybe, maybe you don't doubt because you're quote-unquote childless, whatever that looks like in your connotation. But maybe you do doubt. Maybe you do doubt because you lost a loved one way too soon. Maybe you doubt because you find no joy in your current circumstances in life. Maybe that's the reason why you doubt. Maybe you doubt <laughs> because you feel alone and lost and adrift at sea and there's no one there to tether you back in. Friends, I've been to all those places and all those places lead you to questioning who God is and his goodness and his glory. Our Lord, if we trust in him, he promises to be our shield and defense in these moments that we're stuck waiting in between. He promises to help us prosper and thrive, even, even to the amazing level of Abram, when God tells him that all things are possible, including as many offspring as there are stars in the sky or as sand on the seashore. God is helping Abram see past his current circumstances. That's huge. That's why this covenant is made, to help Abram have the foresight and the vision to see farther than his current predicament. Because God wants Abraham to realize that eternity lasts a whole lot longer than the waiting that we have to do here on this earth. All right? And the funny thing is, is Abram had good reasons to doubt. He really didn't have something cool to fall back on, like the scriptures, okay? The scriptures, with hindsight, as our guide, we know that God has goodness in store for us, don't we? We know that he holds true to his promises. Abram didn't have the scriptures. He didn't have Jesus to read about and look upon and see what it was going to be like. Abram, throughout the whole entire story of his genesis here, we see this faithfulness, unquestioning faithfulness after this covenant is made that is unquestionable, okay? Abraham, if you know his story, has a son, has a son, and God tells him to do something really terrible to his son, sacrifice him. As they travel up the mountain to sacrifice, he builds an altar, puts his son on the altar, and is ready to kill his own son, the son that's supposed to be his heir. And what does God do right before he kills him? He tells him to stop, and then amazingly provides a way with another sacrifice to put. Can you imagine being that son for a second? <laughs> Can you imagine the amount of trust you must have had to have in God to do something like that? Do you think Abraham had a backup plan <laughs> for after that situation? Hmm. But Abraham in this moment at Genesis 15, he couldn't see it. He couldn't fathom how God could give him a child in this old age. Realize, friends, that getting right with God, like Abram does here, it requires Abram to pledge his faith and then trust in God and his endless goodness and his forgiving mercy. That's a quality that we pick up from Abram here out of Genesis 15. We read how he sacrifices these animals kind of strangely, right? Cuts them in half, spreads them apart on the ground, and Abram then scares off a bunch of birds who are looking for a meal. Look, it's weird. Why, why does, we have to go into this a little bit to detail because if, in this biblical age, you know, this is how they used to do contracts, 
back in the biblical time, okay? All right, you know how we do contracts today? We call lawyers, we call notaries. They come in, stamp, approve, so on, so forth, move on with our lives and get done and pay lots of money to do so. That's how we do it, right? Back in biblical times, they would literally sacrifice animals, split them apart, and then the two parties who would make the contract would walk through them. You know what this was? Morbid, first of all, kind of gruesome, but it signified the metaphorical consequences if you didn't hold up your end of the contract. If you were walking through these animals and knew that that was going to be the consequence of you not holding up your end of the deal, I bet you would hold up your end of the deal, wouldn't you? (laughs) It's a lot more effective than a pinky swear or a spit on a handshake, right? It's a lot more effective than that, okay? And here's the crazy part about this godly contract, okay? is we continue on our story, it goes on and says, God says, there'll be stipulations. And he says, your offspring shall be aliens in a land that is not at theirs. And they shall be slaves there. Rings a bell, right? Abraham doesn't know the Exodus story because the Exodus story hasn't happened yet. (laughs) And they shall be oppressed for 400 years and I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. Afterwards, they should come out with great possessions. Abraham doesn't know any of that. He's hearing this going, okay, thanks God, sounds great. Then here's what happens next. Something that I didn't read yet this morning, right in the end of Genesis chapter 15, starting in verse 17. See what God does next in this covenantal contract with Abram. Abram's falling asleep on the ground. He gets this vision with God. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between these pieces. Okay, so there's these things that are passing through these torn animals, signifying the person who's making the contract. Who's making these things walk through? Oh, on that day, it was the Lord who made a covenant with Abram. All right, so follow along with me here. Follow the bouncing ball. To make a contract back in biblical times, both parties are supposed to walk through. But what's Abram doing? He's laying on the ground, asleep, in a vision in his mind. And then when he comes to, he sees this pot and this torch kind of going through. That's interesting, isn't it? Friends, don't you see what's going on here? (laughs) Do you see that it's God who's walking between the pieces of the animals, signifying this promise that God is making? (laughs) Did you notice that Abram didn't have to walk through to make the promise? God's making this promise to Abram, And he's telling Abram he doesn't have to do anything. It's God who's walking through on this contract alone. This might not seem a big deal to the everyday Jane or Joe, but this is a big deal. The symbolism of this event is incredible. It is. It is essentially God making a promise to Abram. He is saying, if you don't keep your end of the promise, Abram, that's okay. I'll take care of it. If I don't, take care of my part of the promise, then I'll pay with my blood. Huh. (laughs) We kind of know how that goes, don't we? We know how the story of God plays out a little bit. When we don't hold up our end of the deal, God says, I'll pay with my blood. And when God doesn't hold up his end of the deal, he says, it's okay, I'll pay with my blood too. You see how that works? That is what the foreshadowing, the vision that is going on here in the covenant between Abraham and God. All the way back in Genesis 15, we see God coming through with the promise of a contract through blood. Should ring a bell to you. I can't overemphasize this enough this morning. This Abraham covenant is a clear sign in Genesis 15 of Jesus Christ, of God pouring out his own blood so that he holds up his end of the deal while we're laying on the ground asleep, or while we're off stuck waiting in between sitting, or while we're waiting for the kingdom to come. Friends, I get it. We are short-sighted. We like a safety net that we don't necessarily have in this life. We are so overwhelmed by sin. But friends, the good news is God holds up his end of the deal forever and ever and ever and ever, and that's why the Abrahamic covenant is so important. It requires us to put a little bit of faith in. But don't worry. If you don't have enough faith today, (laughs) God's going to pay for it with his blood. And if you don't have enough faith tomorrow, guess what? God's going to pay with his blood. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, 
we come before you grateful because you pay for our lot in life. We know how special it makes us feel when someone picks up a check at a meal. We know how important it is when someone offers a helping hand to get us up when we trip and stumble physically, mentally, emotionally. Lord, we appreciate that and are grateful for that. But Lord, we know that when we trip and stumble with sin in our lives, we can only be washed clean because you loved us so through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. We don't always understand why you would do something so crazy. We don't always know why things happen. But Lord, we know that when we trust in you and abide in you, that we can be made whole once again, stuck in the places in between. That is our eternal hope, your salvation, Lord. We love you, God. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.